All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to Acquire and Operate. We are buying and building a portfolio of small niche vertical SaaS businesses, aka SaaS businesses. We're doing it for the love of the game. You know the drill. Today, we are leaning into 5X thematic investment ideas for micro SaaS. Uh, so we're going to start with a look at the basic steps for crafting and executing an investment theme. Uh, we'll take an example of a kind of, I guess you could call it a real world investment theme, but just to kind of see it in practice. And then I'll suggest 5X investment themes that should rip pretty good in micro SaaS. And then I'll conclude with some thoughts, but not just me. I got my boy, Kalu, the whiz, Kev, fresh cut, looking clean as a whistle. How are you, bud? <laughs> oh, I'm feeling good, man. I was just telling you, I feel like I'm 21 again. There's just something about getting a fresh cut, cutting off your beard. It's like, it takes off about 10 years every time. Dude, if I cut off my beard, it takes about 15 years off. They're like, who's this small child? <laughs> <laughs> so no doubt. Um, Why is he talking private equity? <laughs> yeah, yeah, this kid has no business in this room. Um, so I'm like, oh, no, I promise you, I'm, I, I'm, I have some experience. <laughs> yes, um, we're seasoned. Yes. <laughs> no doubt. All right, well, let's jump in, man. So I think head level investment theme. So I think to start like just as a simple point of departure, like the majority of folks in micro SaaS are opportunistic investors, which means they're taking advantage of deals mm -hmm. that they find on marketplaces, deals that they come across that are represented by business brokers or investment bankers, just anybody on the sell side. So they're making, basically making the most of what's available to them. And so I guess with that said, on the other side of the coin, usually a micro SaaS kind of search entrepreneur or acquirer is very clear on their skill set. And generally speaking, it falls into two buckets. I'm either a product person and I'm, yeah, I identify as an engineer, I rip code, I've built products in the past, or I identify as a go-to-market salesperson. And then I, there is, I don't know, there's some gray area there, but usually it's one of those two buckets. And more often than not, an acquirer gets jazzed about identifying a business that they can buy to then apply their skill set. So it's like, ooh, this product, I can easily enhance it or I can expand it and open up, you know, more addressable market, go baby go. Or, oh my goodness, as is our case, you know, this was a, a technical product founder and all the growth has been like true kind of word of mouth, organic growth. I'm going to come in and establish some acquisition channels and we're going to grow the business. Uh, so they're bringing that skill set to the table. And so I think it, it's kind of a shame because more often than not, with that said, they're stepping into a foreign territory. So it's like, I'm stepping into an industry I'm not as familiar with. I'm stepping into an ICP I don't know. I don't know the personas. I don't know the pain points. I don't know the competitive landscape. I don't know the macro trends, on and on and on. So I, I think this is an opportunity for us all to think and kind of step back and ideally introduce an investment theme as like an additional layer of filtration when we're identifying and getting jazzed about deals. Where it's like, I know this category really well. Ideally, I'm going to, you know, if I find a business that's for sale and then it falls into this category that kind of fits into my investment theme, you just have way more working for you. So I'll, I'll pause there and then we'll kind of jump into investment themes. I guess, would you agree with those observations? Yeah, absolutely. And I would even add to that, um, to simplify it even more, right now we're speaking in the context of, you know, acquiring a company. In your personal life, this can be applied to retail trading in the stock market. This can be applied to your savings for your retirement account. What is your outlook for your life? Or you see some, some brand new news announcement, hey, GameStop is riding back up. Before you just use the opportunity to be opportunistic and go invest, you want to understand, like, what is the actual goal here? Does this align with my theme and thesis for what I want for me? Will it make me happier? Will it make me more money? Am I, am I just buying into a trend? That's really what you want to think about as you're approaching this, uh, this process. Totally. So if we abstract and get a little meta with it, right? An investment theme is really a point of view on the world, right? So <laughs> as a simple example, start with the end in mind. It's like, hey, I think that more people are going to be working from home, or I think that this hybrid kind of work from home half the time, work from the office half the time is not going anywhere. The world is moving in that direction. Yeah. Okay. Then how do you exploit that as a business person or an investor? I want to look at, you know, virtual meeting software. I want to look at home for, you know, office equipment. I want to explore all these little elements that should thrive if you are correct and the world is indeed moving towards an increasingly kind of hybrid workspace. So obviously like when COVID landed, there were hedge funds that were like home fitness, home offices, you know, let's short car stocks. <laughs> you know, like there was just a lot of opportunity that was available to them. Um, <laughs> so cool. Um, and then telecommunications, telephony, all of those stocks kind of went up, especially with Zoom and the others. I mean, just job render headphones that kind of shot up too. all the things you wouldn't normally think about um macbooks 
uh, Wi-Fi speeds and connections. And people were just reinvesting in just the essentials that you wouldn't normally think about every day. And now it's, hey, we're going to be all home. So now we have fitness equipment, discounted food, faster Wi-Fi, better equipment. It's all just, uh, let's say, creating a new industry of itself. Totally, totally. Love it, dude. All right, so let's zoom back and uh, we'll just talk like generally speaking, right? So if we're gonna, okay, we wanna define it or how do we go about kind of crafting and executing on an investment theme is the next question, right? So I think the first thing is to sit down and ideally you have a point of view that's been established as a function of the roles that you've had, the industries you've participated in, et cetera, and start to zoom back and say, okay, like what are the themes that I think are interesting in the world? And then from there, you know, like some examples might be sustainability and an in, in offsetting environmental impact innovation in healthcare and more personalized kind of preventative care, digital transformation generally, right? You know, industries at large are still probably like a three out of 10 on average. Like you talk to you know, a lot of industries are still on paper doing very analog processes. So digital transformation is a big one or specialized consumer services. We've spoken about that a lot. Um, you know, drop shipping to the highly personalized products with your logo on it, et cetera. There's a lot of this kind of like final mile customization that's very interesting on the consumer side. So anyway, you kind of think through these print uh, on demand. themes and well, yeah, print on demand, right? As we've explored pretty at length. Um, and then from there you start to think, okay, so this is a theme or a point of view that I'm bullish on that I see the world moving toward. And then you step into like, okay, let's analyze the market. So let's look at the industries that are going to be impacted by this. Let's look at any type of regulatory elements uh, that are interesting. Like, you know, obviously if you're looking in healthcare, it's like, okay, let's, let's kind of look at what the regulatory trends are. Um, and then you start to lean in and actually understand the competitive landscape. So it's like, I've got this point of view on the world. I think these industries are going to be impacted. This is what's happening in these industries. These are the players that are already ripping and rocking. And from there, you, you, yeah. you kind of have a general point of view that, that is really the hardest part. <laughs> that first stage, I made it sound like, oh, just do some research and you'll come up with it. But that's the tough part. And then once you're positioned that way, then you can start to lean into actually identifying companies where it's like, okay, we've got this macro theme and the way that the world's going to go. These are the industries that are going to be impacted. This is kind of what's happening in those categories. Here are some very specific companies that I think are going to benefit, or I guess if we're talking about, you know, like trading or that I think are going to get hurt, right? Because there are moves that you can make that way if you foresee a decline with some of these businesses, but we're going to keep it bullish because in our game, we're acquiring businesses under the pretenses that they're going to th thrive, right? That there's going to be some natural kind of tailwinds that are working for you. Uh, so you identify target companies, and then from there, you establish screen criteria. So it's like, what do we, we've just done all this work on kind of the levers and the performance metrics that matter in this category. From there, you can reverse engineer a scorecard that helps you understand, okay, these are the companies that are, or this is what base rate performance looks like. This is what outstanding looks like. And now you start to have a filtering mechanism that helps you identify companies that are going to rip. And then from there, you start to build a pipeline. Anything to add? No. Beautiful. I mean, so we had touched about this and I guess, as part like screening criteria, there's obviously a lot of overlap between screening criteria or identifying target companies dovetails pretty quickly into developing investment criteria. And we spoke about like kind of the screening methodology, but then you want to start to get really like a much sharper grasp on what are the performance metrics. So what are the mechanics of the business? What are the, the inputs and the outputs? How do, if we look at this business as a system, what are the constraints? What are the things that make it perform well? Who's performing better relative to others? You're trying to establish a relative point of view, right? Is this a, is this a good business? I don't know. It, it all depends on, is this a good business compared to what? Compared to the most productive business in the world? Maybe not. <laughs> compared to the most productive business in their category? Maybe big time. And then obviously from there, you can start to understand, okay, this is what these base rates look like. This is what performance looks like. Now I have a relative point of view on the performance of a business and I understand where valuation is. Uh, or I'm sorry, not valuation, where value is on a, again, a relative basis. We're back to our analogy with sizing up apartments, right? It's like, cool, I understand now that these apartments should trade at about a million bucks. The big motivator is, is proximity to the beach. You know, like you start to figure out what this stuff looks like. Um, and then you can start to think about, okay, if we were to improve these businesses, what does that start to look like in terms of cash flows? Like how will this business cash flow in the next year, two years, three years, four years, five years? Cool. What does that look like four or five years out? If we execute on that value creation plan and it's cash flowing at X and the profit margin is Y and the growth rate is Z. Ooh, okay. This starts to shape up like a pretty interesting uh, return profile. And then lastly, you got to plan your exit. So it's like, okay, we're in this space. You know, if we grow it to X, Y, Z, are we relevant for strategics? Uh, is there a pool of financial sponsors that we know that like this category, but don't touch it until it gets to a certain revenue threshold? There's a lot of different things that are available to you. But usually when it comes to the exit strategy, you're thinking about strategic people. So we're a 
th- we're doing something that's very valuable to another company and that would motivate them to buy us. Either it's technology or customers or something that they would rather acquire and buy than partners with someone else or build, right? The OG kind of three-part decision is build, partner, buy. And there you go. So that's, and then from there, I mean, honestly, that's kind of the locking and tackling of stuff that we haven't really dove into pretty extensively because from there you go into an engaging inquire. So inter- interacting with those CEOs, with those founders, with those hypothetical sellers, gauging their interest about it in an exit event, a liquidity event, bringing on a capital partner. Uh, and then if they're jazzed about it, then you move into an LOI and agreeing on valuation and payment terms. And then you move into a period of due diligence and exclusivity where it's your job to have identified those red flags and knock them down in sequential order so that you can build conv- conviction around the deal, around the business and around whatever your game plan is to make it more valuable. And then from here, you, you zoom out a little bit because, oh God, we've got one. So we've got this investment theme and, and we'll lean into another one. We've built a universe of, or a perspective on it. We've built a universe of relevant companies. We've engaged some of these companies. We've acquired one of these companies. Now we have a, a business that's in our portfolio. Now you need to start to think about portfolio construction. And a lot of this <laughs> is like, how do we kind of offset the risk or the upside that's present in one portfolio company by acquiring something else that's complementary? So if one super high growth, which is not super common in our world, but if one's very you know high growth, maybe you want to offset that with something that's very high cash flow but stable growth. So you start to think about a portfolio as a puzzle that you want to really strategically put together so that you offset your risks and get to some kind of blended place that you feel very confident in uh, that's going to perform on average really well. And I touched on strategic partnerships. That's interesting. But I think if you're executing a thematic thing, you can also be way more intentional about like, if we were to put together a board for our portfolio, who are the five most ninja ass people that have the most interesting perspective on this category? Cool. Let's pull them in and let's incentivize them to share their point of view, to help us with our thought process, to poke holes in, in you know, kind of areas that we find risky, et cetera. And then you execute and you scale it. And then obviously you got to keep a real airtight view on performance management because you need to see how you're doing. And you obviously then need to communicate that out to your investors, to your stakeholders, and make sure that they're tracking, pacing with what you're doing and that they're increasingly jazzed and that you're more importantly, increasingly jazzed, right? Because I think it's always a point in time decision and you want to be very real with yourself and not get too emotionally attached to an investment theme where it's like, Hey, we made this first acquisition and it's not really panning out very well. What have we learned from that? Can we extract the learning? How can we iterate? You should always, if you're not, if you get to, you know, if two quarters go by and you have the exact same point of view, that should probably spook you because that implies that you're not learning along the way. But I guess you always want to detach the emotional attachment, which is very hard when you craft this thing. And it's like, I think the world's going to go this way. It's very kind of vulnerable, exposing experience, but you got to be ready to cut bait if things move south. Yeah. And I would add to that as well around the strategic partnerships. It would be, let's say the Holy Grail, if you can find a strategic partner, let's say like a creative marketer um, or someone in growth, someone on the, let's say sales side um, or M&A side that can help to speed up the due diligence process. Wherever they land in terms of um, expertise that can help to push your vision for the investment thesis forward, if you can get them to buy into that investment thesis, so they're following you from one port code to the other one, that is essentially is the holy grail because we all know how difficult it is today to recruit stellar talent and then to also have stellar strategic partners. Um, in working with the individuals between communication, mismanagement of projects and all of these things, that slows down the success and the performance of any acquisitions. If you can find a really good strategic partner that works well with one port code, see how well those skills can be extrapolated across the entire portfolio. And if you can get them bought in, happy days. No doubt. Right. And then you're kind of building system, so to speak, or, or points of view edges that are enduring and sustainable for the long term. And the more you can introduce and, and build or create something that has a long term perspective, the more you'll take advantage of kind of the compounding benefits over time. So yeah, I totally align there. All right, so we're going to look at an example and we're going to buzz through this one pretty quickly so that we can move on to the, the 5X examples that we pulled together from MicroSAS. Uh, so if we were looking mm-hmm. at sustainable water purification, they would be like, we are polluting the shit out of the planet Earth. Water is the most finite like source of life and we need to come up with a way. Literally. Like, and you know, because and the thing that you'll quickly realize is with investment themes too, it's like a lot of them are like, yeah, duh. The main thing is the timeline. But it's like, yes. but when is this going to happen, right? If you're too early... You might burn out before you get there. If you're too late, you miss a lot of the value creation in the, in the economy. The timing is obviously the mission critical component. But if we were looking at sustainable water, for, water purification, it would be basically to focus on sustainability and environmental protection to advance water purification technologies. Okay, so now let's zoom out and let's look at the market. Let's look at global water scarcity issues. Let's look at regulatory support for clean water initiatives. What are the big technology adva- advancements that are opening up water purification? Um, and obviously water purification 
it, this is meant to be a, an example that is not good for micro <laughs> yeah. it, it turns out the, the market for water is is in, in maybe the biggest market on the planet earth uh, so probably something that unless you find like the wildest niche but probably something that you wouldn't want to play too hard with micro because you've got like governments going after this but uh, and then you identify target companies okay so who are some of the startups or smaller companies that are specializing in this um and then you have start to form or inform a relative basis cool which ones do i think are performing the best which ones are performing the worst what are the kpis that help you understand the the, the productivity and the performance of these businesses great you start to, to slap together an investment criteria like this is what we're looking for we want to get in at this revenue range we want to see this kind of growth we want to see this type of you know xyz uh, and then you move into an engaging engage and inquire execute the, the game plan build a build a portfolio and this is one where like diversification in the portfolio might be like hey we want to buy this very specific water purification technology and then we want to reduce our exposure to this area and we want to acquire a technology that's you know pretty distant but still in the overarching theme of sustainable kind of water purification or it might be a geographic dif differentiation i'm sorry uh diversification so they want to acquire something in like a progressive western market and then we want to acquire something in more of an emerging economy and so you start to put your your thought process together that way that was about as fast as I could possibly buzz through that. Is that cool? <laughs> yeah, no, that's pretty cool. Um, and I was going to say a good real life example of this is, uh, I mean, Tesla and what they did with the renewable energy market over the last decade. You know? They encouraged the government to invest more in renewable energy, got them to subsidize the development of the uh, electrical chargers, um, got them to also push for other automakers to um, start developing cars using renewable energy. And now they're also buying energy credits back from Tesla. Yeah. Everyone thought Tesla was going to burn out before the market caught up, and it found just a way to stay sticky by playing through the uh, uh, the regulatory uh, play. And if you, think, you want to talk about somebody who's going after the largest, most ambitious investment themes of all time, it's like Elon. Uh, we need to transition from fossil fuels. Like basically, this is at, to some degree a finite energy source. It's in humanity's interest to, to take advantage of you know more economic and more sustainable energy sources. And oh yeah, it's probably the case that an asteroid will hit planet Earth at some point. So we need to become a multi-planetary species. So I'm going to go yep. hard at electrifying humanity and making humanity interplanetary. So that is like literally the opposite of micro SAS. <laughs> and I think yeah, literally, <laughs> if we invert too, that's always a very useful mental model. So if you want to figure out what we should be doing, just look at players like that and just do the opposite. <laughs> um, yes. <laughs> so some of the investment themes I pulled together, and these are very detailed in the sub stack that's shipping on Saturday, but we've got sustainable agriculture and food tech, personalized healthcare and wellness, uh, cybersecurity and data privacy, smart cities and urban innovation, and then digital transformation in traditional industries. So if we start, let's just look at two of these. So let's look at, um, let's look at, which one do you wanna look at? Yeah, I was, <laughs> you saw me itching. I was gonna pick either cybersecurity or digital transformation. I'm gonna go with cybersecurity because we touched on digital transformation as it relates to retail traders, but with cyber, you, it's you, gotten bad. <laughs> yeah, so, you know, all right, yeah cyber, sorry, you broke up just a little bit. Cyber, you want to go cybersecurity? Yeah, yeah, I want to go cybersecurity because it's it's getting really bad out here. <laughs> okay, well, and this one is and again right. This one's right on the cost because this is also a huge, huge market, right? So I mean, cybersecurity, everything is cyber nowadays, um, and data privacy. Every human is creating data all day long. Businesses create data all day long. Um, but here are just yeah. some examples. Uh, uh, so the theme over you here would be solutions focused on protecting data, ensuring privacy, and preventing cyber threats. Um, so the potential focus could be intrusion detection and penetration testing. So tools that basically identify security breaches, fraud detection, systems for identifying you know when kind of uh, financial commercial fraud is happening, identity theft, and then uh, privacy protection. And so that's just kind of more at the consumer level, uh, but also a ton of, of applications in the business world. I mean, the bottom line is that you look at growth drivers, right? There's totally rampantly increasing frequency of cyber attacks. There's tons of regulation in, around data protection um, and everything's increasingly digital, right? So I think this market is growing very, very fast. Yeah, and to add to that, I would say, um, I mean, just look at what happened with uh, Berkshire Hathaway Class A stocks last week, where there was a glitch in the stock market, and it showed like it was ninety nine percent down for a few hours. You know what I'm saying? A lot of these potential um, intrusions or just clogging of the funnels, like let's say the pipes, so data can get through. A lot of those things are around data privacy and cybersecurity. 
now is getting to a point where people are not only being able to take control of all your devices just with one click of a file. Fishing is so easy to do now. People are also, like we talked about earlier, being mindful of the smaller companies that are getting ahead of the curve. A lot of them have gone beyond multi-factor authentication, and you have a lot of startups now creating um, cybersecurity methods around quantum computing. They're using qubits programming. Now, if you do that kind of programming, that is a smart way to start securing your systems. However, that's way beyond where the industry is now. And if you were to flip that dynamic and use the qubits programming for hacking, you can hack every system. Yeah. Cybersecurity right now is literally the number one thing that's most important to every government. I mean, let's oh. talk about Russia and China. Everything you hear about going on in the news, there's hacking happening literally every minute. Banks are getting held for ransom. Tight embargoes are getting held, their, their data for ransom. I mean, now these startups are creating newer solutions that just aren't ready for the world yet. It's, it's an interesting time to play. It's an interesting space to play in, um, but being very mindful of those startup companies that are preaching and saying, hey, we can secure your data with these new methodologies. We just aren't there yet, and it's not as promising as it seems. Totally. It's, I, I mean, the whole here, right? And these were still pretty macro, like, focus areas within a very big theme. Um, so you got to just continue to niche down. So it's like, all right, I want to do, you know, data security for veterinary clinics, you know, or whatever I want to do <laughs> data security for this very obscure data type. Um, you know, whatever the case may be. And I mean, then if course, e-commerce stores, they got a lot of data. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And sensitive private data, right? Like credit cards and stuff. So the, the, another one, digital transformation in, in traditional industries, right? So, you know, I, I think this one is near and dear to our heart as we'll kind of conclude with. But, you know, you've got construction tech, so think software for project management, smart construction, building information, modeling. Um, on the legal tech side, you've got just practice management, mm -hmm. compliance, intellectual property management. Um, on the prop tech side, you've got real estate management, you've got compliance, you've got smart buildings, you've got property marketplaces. There's a lot of stuff there. And we can generally say that the growth driver is a need for more efficient systems because basically a lot of these categories are catching up to what's considered status quo across different industries um and then of course that as consumers and just as humans we're increasingly adopting technology so there's like this natural inertia that's working with business because we're all using you know technology more and more and more so cool we've got a few minutes left here so concluding thoughts I, you know establishing an investment theme is a focusing exercise that will be productive mm -hmm. no matter what. I think just for all of us to lock ourselves in a room and think for a day about where we think the world is going is very useful. And then if you can add that as a filtration mechanism for when you're originating and, and making and executing acquisitions, it should only serve you. Uh, the thing I wanted to say as a word of caution though, is that when you invest or when you go super hard at themes based on big macro trends, that starts to look and feel like venture capital very fast. Right. Mm -hmm. it's like, I think mm -hmm. this tidal wave of a trend is going to totally change the world. It's going to change all of business. It's like, all right, then you should raise some venture and go hard <laughs> like, at kind of yeah. capitalizing that change, accelerating it, and then capturing all the value. So one thing, and, and I guess this now will get pretty personal with it, but like, I like to think about inevitabilities. Um, it's like, you know, what can we say is an inevitability in a very established kind of industry that already makes up the fabric of society? So there's, you're not speculating on whether this industry will grow or change. You're speculating on the state of an industry, be, like inevitably achieving some kind of outcome that is maybe it catching up to the rest of the world. So in my view, AKA digital transformation is a very kind of risk adjusted theme because we can assume that the majority, like at some, and that comes back to the timing, but at some stage, every industry under the sun is going to digitally transform, move up that technology maturity, that digital transformation curve uh, to some degree. And then if you step back, so, you know, we're very bullish on digital transformation in very niche traditional industries that are established and mature and they're not going anywhere. Again, they're kind of like part of our everyday infrastructure. And then we zoom back and we think about the three pillars of kind of business operations, which are your customers, aka CRM, your, your books, your finances, aka accounting and ERP, and then your teams, your employees. H human capital management, HR tech, however you want to think about it. So when we pull together mm -hmm. digital transformation in traditional niche industries that touches those three enduring, highly, I guess, uh, and I guess enduring is the right word, elements and, and kind of traditional functions of business, you start to pull together an investment theme that, that starts to feel ironclad. And, and that's really where we've been going hard. Anything to add to that in closing, Kev? Yeah, I was going to say digital transformation also drives consolidation. So that's a good outlook for a solid roll-up strategy as you start to focus on certain industries as well.
Totally. And th- now you can start to see how these pieces all fit together, right? Where it's like, we're bullish on digital transformation in traditional niche industries. We want to fixate on things that touch the customers, the books, or the people. And oh my goodness, we have an opportunity in this traditional niche industry to roll up the highest performing CRM, HR suite, and ERP into one cohesive platform that can serve as the spinal cord of the business and kind of move towards a platform play. And then it's like, cool, we're going to accelerate the digital transformation. We're going to consolidate the tech stack in this category, and we're going to own it. And we're going to put out our elbows and, and try to defend that profit margin as long as we can. Okay. Yep. Salesforce, scaling, baby. And, and scaling <laughs> ventures. I mean, that's what we're out here doing. Uh, <laughs> scaling <not> ventures. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, with uh, 30 seconds to spare. So good stuff, K. Lou. Always a pleasure to chop it up with you, my man. I think this is... Uh, I've had a lot of fun these last few episodes, and I think this has all been really, really good, you know, kind of exercises to sharpen our points of view as, as we step into the next chapter and pursue our second acquisition. So it's, uh, it's an exciting time, man. Thrilled to share the field of battle with you. Yeah, absolutely. Same here. And uh, listening back to the episodes, it's nice to hear our maturation and how we did, uh, um, digest and share the content. So yeah, man, here's to another year. <laughs> no doubt. All right, buddy. Go get him the rest of the day. I'll catch you later. You too. Peace. The girls. Yeah, lasers. Oh my God, we got to get the lasers. There it is. Wow. <laughs> All right, buddy. All right, buddy.